full uh, groove again. And we're going to get straight into this talk. My talk is going to be on the testimony we have in Christ. Uh, I think you got a sneak peek a couple of weeks ago into this talk. So we're going to get right into it as time is moving along quickly. If you want to turn with me to 1 Peter, please. Head straight into 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter 2. And we're going to read just verse 9 here. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So, great scripture there. We have been called into a great honor, um, a great position, a position of righteousness. But not only that, we have uh, been put in charge of continuing what Jesus started all those years ago. And will ultimately finish when he comes back. But being a peculiar, peculiar people means that we have become a chosen people. Um, you know, just stop and think about that, that word for a minute as a chosen people. God walked into a store, saw you on the shelf, picked you off the shelf and purchased you. He saw something in you, pulled you out of the world and filled you with the Holy Spirit and set you on a path of righteousness. Out of everybody who lives on this planet, lives in this world, he saw something in you and he chose you, he chose you out of everybody else. Now, everybody on this earth is going to get called. They're going to hear the gospel. They're going to hear the word. All four corners of this planet are going to hear his word. But not everybody is going to be chosen. Everyone in this room and those that are listening uh, on Zoom have been chosen. Now, um, this makes us both kings and priests, which is what a, uh, a royal priesthood is. We have been made royalty. We have been made to be a sacred place or we have been made sacred. But not only that, we have been made to be separate from this world. But the most important part of this scripture is that we have been called to show the praises of God who called us out of darkness. Now, let's flip over to Matthew. Let's head over to Matthew in the New Testament. Uh, chapter 5, verse 14. We're going to read down to verse 16 here. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. When the world goes dark, the Lord's children become alive, I like to say. And by alive, I mean we become very apparent. Um, when the world falls into chaos, um, they fall into an absolute darkness. And in the complete absence of light, you, you, you very much can't see anything at all. If you removed all light sources from a room, you would see absolutely nothing. Um, you know, the reason why I can see everybody in this room today is because there is a light source reflecting off their molecules. If there was no light to, to be reflected, I, I wouldn't be able to see them. Um, humans aren't self-illuminating beings, so we need a light source to be seen. Without the Holy Spirit, we are without light and we blend into the darkness. But we have been filled with the Holy Spirit and a great fire of light has been lit within us, uh, illuminating us in this dark world. 
And now being the lights of the world in a dark place, we become easier to see. We stand out a lot better in amongst all the chaos. We are that beacon or that, uh, that glimmer of hope on display for all to see. Uh, you know, that we, we have an answer, we have a power, which doesn't come uh, from us, but from somewhere else, which is God. You know, when the world is looking and searching around for hope, we become very prominent, easy to, easy to see as that hope, that something that, you know, that they, they know that something is different. They can see, they can see us, and they know that something is different. Let's flip over to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 4. Through to verse 7, I'm going to read. If everybody's there. Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed or uh, listen, hearken, that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of war. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famine and pestilences, or diseases, and earthquakes in diverse places, or numerous places. Now, I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing this word but it's, it's current for our situation right now, the, the, the pandemic, the, you know, the, the pestilence that we have currently in our life. It, the pestilent, you know, this pandemic may pass and may go on and this world may begin to forget about it and uh, move into their sense of peace, if you like. However, through scripture, we have learned that there is a day coming uh, things will unfortunately get worse before they get better. Matthew 24 verse 4 just told us this. You know, we, we can't get caught up in, in um, we can't get caught up in, in it all. We can't let the world defeat us or deceive us. We, we need to press on. We have to continue on what we are, what we are trying to uh, accomplish. Um, and caught up, you know, I mean, giving into all of the fear, into all of the temptations that are presenting itself at the moment, which, which are becoming more numerous every single day. You just have to click on the news, watch a TV program. All those temptations are there. We need to remain separate from all of it and continue to shine our light and walk in the Lord, you know. We shouldn't hide it away in fear of persecution. We have nothing to be ashamed of. He set us free, gave us power to overcome and to prosper. And most importantly, the power to obtain salvation. We need to let the world know that we are a part of something special, something beyond this world and beyond its issues and problems. The most important part is that uh, they can have the same thing. That's what we must let them know, that they can have what we have. Luke chapter 19, please. Chapter 19, verse 41. And I'm going to read down to verse 44. And when Jesus, I oh sorry, and when he, which is Jesus, was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, 
the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come unto thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, uh, and compass thee around, and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, or kill you, and they and thy children with within thee. And they shall not leave in in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Now, Jesus wept over Jerusalem here because he knew what was coming. And because of their unwillingness to adhere or submit to the things of God, they had a pending doom. Their doom was coming. Um, they had no idea what the true quality of peace is or even how to obtain it. Because God's peace is that peace that passes all understanding. The peace that can only be obtained through the Holy Spirit, through God. Because it's the peace and joy in knowing that we have salvation, that the Lord cares for us, that the Lord will supply all of our needs, and we don't have to worry about a thing. That's the true peace of God. And that's why it passes all understanding, because without that reassurance, without the Holy Spirit, without the power and fire within us, the meaning of peace is obscured to us and cannot be obtained. Not the true peace anyway. God's peace doesn't rely on the temporary as man's peace does. God's peace lasts forever and it is built around salvation. Uh, so these people in Jerusalem just continued doing what they were doing, unaware of that pending threat or that pending doom. Now, the same thing could be said now as the world becomes more unruly, uh, more ungodly, they are doomed. They can't see it. So, and they just continue to live their version of peace. But there is a day coming, a day of judgment, a day of reckoning, doom, doom is coming. But brothers and sisters, we know all of this and know that, and know that these things will happen. Um, I think uh, Pastor Mark has spoken of this a couple of times. The Bible is like a cheat sheet. Okay, we, um, you know, it gives us all the answers. We can flip to the back of the book at any time we want and gain the knowledge that Jesus wins. And we have, we have a peace, you know, that peace that passes all understanding in knowing that the Lord has his hands on all things which gives us that peace and comfort. You know, we, as spirit-filled Christians, we don't enjoy what we see happening around, um, around us and what we still know is coming. Um, but we all do know, as spirit-filled Christians who have read the, the Bible from cover to cover, we know it won't end until the Lord comes and wins the day. However, um, there are people out there that don't know this and they can see what's going on out in the world and they feel that despair by what they see. And I know this because at times um, I have looked around and I can see the things happening around me, around the world. And sometimes I feel that despair for a moment. Uh, and then I remember that I don't have to because I know the truth. That as long as I continue to adhere and submit to the Lord, all things are going to be worked out for the better. For his glory and more, most importantly for our salvation. But there are people out there that... Um, uh, Uh, yeah, there, there are people out there that do know what's going on. They just don't know what to do about it. They're at a loss. So they just continue to, to go about their shopping, go to the movies and live in ignorant, um, ignorance, blissful ignorance 
trying to ignore it because if you ignore it, right, it, it doesn't exist. It's not happening, right? But, and that's why as spiritual Christians, we can't just bunk it down because we are safe. The gospel isn't just for us. Acts 2, verse 38 through to 37 tells us that it's for as many as God is going to call. We need to be out there ready, and the most important part, willing, so that God uh, can use us. You know, there is no point to being called to do a work if we hide from God and remain ignorant to what is required of us. But in saying all of that, we do still need to make sure that we remain connected and walking straight. It's no good if we put all our time and effort into others and forget to fasten our own seatbelts. But there, the most important part is there are people out there that do need to know and want to know the gospel of God. Now, and I, I'm, I think Josh and Cassie can relate to this, but I've spoken of this a, a couple of times that I was just one of many generations uh, that were lucky enough to have been born into the fellowship. Um, and what that means is, for those who are kind of puzzled by that, it just means that both of my parents were spirit-filled and walking in the Lord by the time I was born. So they took me to Sunday school every day and they took me to fellowship. Um, I have always had the truth growing up from a, being a child, a teenager into adulthood. The truth was always there for me. I was always taught that truth. Uh, I didn't always appreciate it as a, as a child growing up and experiencing things for the first time. But in the end, I'm glad that the Lord was finally, has finally gotten through to me and, and has shown me the life I could have had instead. Um, you know, as one of those lost and confused, uh, people out there in the world that you see out there today. But there are people out there that do need to hear the gospel. We are God's mouthpiece, but not only that, um, a testimony of God's power and grace is what we represent. We need, we need to show them through pointing it out in the scripture and through our testimony that there is hope out there and it is the Lord. And the world needs to be told this. You know, so as we as we perhaps go home today after the meeting and we go to sleep, we hit our heads hit the pillows and we and we raise uh, you know, we wake up, the alarm wakes us up and we say, Praise the Lord, I'm in a place of safety and a place of refuge. We've got to remember who we are as a as a people, as a spirit filled uh, people the work that we've been called to do, and we've got to consider and remember those people out there that are still lost out there, that are uh, living in darkness um, as the world is today. Uh, I think we've got time. Let's flip over to Nehemiah. I think we've got time for this one. Flip over to Nehemiah, please, and chapter 4, verse 15. I'm going to read down to verse 23. And it came to pass, when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, and God had brought their counsel to naught, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass, from that time forth, that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both their spears, the shields, and the bows, and the harbour jeans, which I think is like a, a cloak or some kind of garment, and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They which built on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that laid it, every one with, with one of his hands wrought in the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. For the builders 
everyone had his sword girded by his side and so built builded and he that sounded the trumpet was by me and i said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people uh the work is great and large and we are separate upon the wall and far from one another and in that place Therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, our God shall fight for us. So we labored in the work, uh, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let every one with his servant lodge with Jerusalem, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, uh, saving that everyone put them off for washing. Now, when Nehemiah was leading the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem, enemies of the Israelites kept trying to attack them while they worked uh, but this passage from nehemiah shows how great teamwork was in helping get the job done half of the israelites worked on the wall while the other half stood guard with their spears uh, this is how we need to be with our walk standing firm in the lord and it is done by putting on the full armor of god this includes filling our life with faith, uh, truthfulness, righteousness, peace, and faith. To put on the full armor of God, we must include him in all that we do. The best thing about being a team, or the one thing about being a team, and I, I'm sure Pastor Mark can speak of this, being a volleyball coach, is that all the players come together for that one purpose, to work together to achieve that one purpose or desire. And our purpose, being the children of God, is not to win a trophy or a gold medal, but is to serve God, to overcome the world, and being there when his son comes to call us home. And when a team is in complete harmony, when they are all on the same page, the team is hard to beat and it is impenetrable. They can achieve whatever goal they have set out to achieve while working together. And to understand that purpose in order to achieve it, we have to understand what that purpose is. That's where we can guide each other, help each other, share the testimonies, preach the word of God together so that each and every one of us can understand that purpose. So uh, we can all be a part of that team, uh, helping each other to stand united and firm against the world um, who are going to try to divide us. You know, uh, this, the world trying to divide us has never been more apparent than, than the times that we are living in now. Everyone in the world at the moment seems to have a, or seem to be, seems to be practicing uh, one kind of thought, and that is evil is good and good is evil. Everything about God is nonsense, and we should be able to do whatever we want when we want. You know, his teachings are, uh, are nothing, and they're just fairy tales. We don't have to listen to a word of it. We can't let these ideas pull us asunder. Uh, working together as a team, as a solid spirit-filled body of Christ will help us to be able to stop any of these evil thinking from penetrating the body, penetrating us and pulling us to pieces. Uh, so that we can continue to show the world that the Lord is the same yesterday, today and forever. Those are the three periods of time. He is the same in the past.
which is yesterday. He is the same currently, which is today. And he will be the same in the future, which is forever. God is the answer. He was back then. He, uh, he is today and nothing's going to change. He will always be that answer for this world. And by being a strong testimony, by being united together in the same purpose, this is a testimony of God. And it demonstrates to the world that he is the answer and he always will be. So I think I'm going to leave it there. I had a lot more to say, but time is moving and I'm getting the feeling I need to end it here. So just when we're out there, we're in the world, just remember who we are what our purpose is and that we need to stay firm as united uh, people, spirit filled. We can't let the world distract us from what our true purpose is. We can't be divided. We need to work together as they, as Nehemiah did in rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. So we can achieve that goal, that goal. And that goal is to preach the gospel and to be there when the Lord returns. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs>